Allahu nurus samawati wal ard. Nahmatuhu wa nusalli ala akhtihid kareem. Audhu billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri. Wahlul uqtatan min lithani yafqahu qawli. Our topic for today is science and Islam. Is it contradictory or is it complementary? Before we begin our discussion, let us ponder for a few seconds over a couple of thoughts. What do you think was the biggest problem that the Quraysh had with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Of all the stars that have names, two thirds have Arabic names. It's interesting that while the constellations are Greek and Roman, the names are Arabic. There's no calculus without algebra. We all know that. But can you think where the word algebra comes from, or the word algorithm? Our numerals are called Arabic numerals. Have you ever stopped and thought about that? Why is that? Now, the relationship between religion and science has been discussed by many, many people, philosophers, theologians, scientists, religious scholars, and they use many terms like scientism, logical positivism, creationism versus evolution, revelation versus investigation, humanism, naturalism. People have different views about their relationships. Some believe that science and religion are in conflict and competition with each other, and there are different ways of approaching things and the uh, the two ways are not compatible to each other some believe that religion is even losing the argument with modernity some believe that religion and science are actually independent of each other for example uh, reverend john porkinghorn says why is the water boiling in the tea kettle we could think about it scientifically like it is uh, boiling because the at this temperature the vapor chain you know the water changes from liquid to vapor or we could say a non scientific answer like the, uh, it is boiling because I put the kettle on the stove. None of these answers are wrong, but they're different ways of looking at things. Stephen Che Gold actually uh, brought up a non-overlapping magisteria model for science and religion, which shows them as two separate things. And uh, the subject of origins under his model comes under science, where human beings come from is a scientific study and religion has nothing to do with it according to this model. Another, uh, mod another opinion is that science and religion actually adapt to each other. And if science proves something wrong, the religion has to change, which is some people believe. Some people believe that science and religion are actually in harmony with each other, that uh, the wonders of uh, the universe actually uh, show us the power of God and they actually bring us closer to God. Albert Einstein, for example, said science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let us look at a bit of an historical background. The relationship between science and religion is actually a recent debate, which started only in the 19th century at such a large scale. In pre-modern society, religion and religious teachings were the most important thing. The emphasis for every society and all people over all times before the pre-modern society was on religion. And that meant three things, God, soul, and afterlife. God for different people mean, meant different things. Soul, again, was some unseen mystical part that needed to be saved. And afterlife was whether you would be resurrected as something or um, you would go to heaven or hell. But this life wasn't everything in itself. Before Islam, the most records that we have are of Greek science and philosophy, Greek and Roman. And we are all familiar with names like Hippocrates, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Most records that we have of science at that period was hypothetical, speculative, and imaginary, and there was not much evidence of experimentation in science. Islam began with uh, the birth of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the revelation of Quran started at 610. This is Islam as we know it. Of course, we know that Islam actually is the Deen of Fitrah. We'll come back to that later, though. Uh, the traditional Orientalist theory basically sounds like this that we had all these books and we deposited them in this bank of the Muslim Khilafah and we never looked at them. So after Greek and Roman period, the whole Islamic period was actually serving like a bank. It stored all these books for the Europeans. They just stayed there. And then after 800 years, these great Europeans just rediscovered these books and then basically that is it. Does that sound all right to you? Or is there something missing here? Was this age that uh, is, by some it's called the dark age and by some it's called the golden age. Let's look a little bit more at what happened during this time. There's no doubt that the highest form of knowledge for a Muslim is the knowledge of Quran and Sharia. 
However, this never, never brings down the value of secular sciences for a Muslim. For example, for a Muslim to learn how to make a bridge, this is, which facilitates the movement of people across the river, is as much an act of worship as giving money in charity. Man has always looked at the universe around him, and Muslim scholars did that too, but they did look at it for the, for the sake of Allah. They had something greater in mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told them in the Holy Quran to ponder, to look at his signs and to contemplate. The Prophet sallam, had told them to seek knowledge, even if they had to go as far as China to find it. The knowledge of religion in its highest form was already available to Muslims in the form of Quran and Sunnah. So what was this knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ wanted the Muslims to seek? The Muslims in this era understood this hadith and they acted upon it. They were following the instructions of their creator, the injunctions in the Holy Quran and the directors of the Prophet ﷺ. Muslims in this period collected all this thought but they didn't just collect it, they expanded on that thought, they debated on it, they critiqued a lot of it, they threw out a lot of it and they developed some of it. And it was later reintroduced to Europe and the rest of the world solely with commentaries. Most of it, and if not all, of European science of 14th century onwards were heavily based on scientific advancements of the Islamic civilization. For example, grammar, which is a deep intellectual analysis of a language, was actually pioneered by Muslims in the deep study of Arabic grammar. If any of you have started to uh, learn or, or if you start to learn even a little bit of Arabic, you would understand how deep and how intellectual the Arabic grammar is as compared to any other language in the world. Before that, grammar used to be a superficial study. Arabic grammarians went into depth and they recognized patterns which were not recognized in the language before. Symmetric trees and diagrams were created. Before that, grammar studies were very rudimentary. Muslim scientific, Muslims scientifically broke down the Arabic language. Besides, hadiths or the saying of the Prophet ﷺ is also one of the greatest intellectual contributions to the human society. It was the first really deep critical analysis of the spoken word. The muhaddiths or uh, the people who study hadith are deeply knowledgeable and analytical people. Just Google this and see how many words in Arabic, English have Arabic origins you'll be pleasantly surprised. Intellectual powerhouse of the world was Baghdad, which, uh, which had the House of Wisdom uh, or the modern day libraries, which come slightly closer to them. But they were, uh, the House of Wisdom were basically the libraries, come scientific laboratories, come uh, the places for uh, having debates and community centers all at the same time. A thousand years ago, Baghdad boasted of these intellectual establishments. The scholars do uh, collections from Persian cultures, Indian cultures and Greek cultures and put them all together under one roof and they made research, further research on those topics and they made a lot of discoveries. The massive libraries that were built had books on every subject and in many languages. This intellectual powerhouse turned Baghdad into the headquarters of arts, science and writing. This house of wisdom was open to men and women of all faiths. Caliph al mamun used to carry, used camels to carry hundreds of books and manuscripts from other parts of the Muslim world to the house of wisdom. The library grew so large that al mamun built extensions to house different branches of knowledge. So many scholars wanted to come that he had to expand the study centers all the time. Uh, Caliph al mamun encouraged the translators and scholars uh, by paying them the weight of each completed book in gold. He built an astronomy center in Baghdad. The scholars met each day for reading, writing, discussion in different languages, including Arabic, Persian, Greek, and Syria. Experts worked to translate writings from other civilizations into Arabic. There's even a, cra uh, a lunar crater named al Manon after the ruler al Ma'mun and his uh, great love for knowledge. Other cities in Islamic world also followed Baghdad's lead and created their own versions of House of Wisdom. Baghdad at one point had 36 libraries and more than 100 book dealers. One of the streets in Morocco had 100 bookshops and libraries 50 on each side. The library of Zaytuna Mosque in Tunisia had more than 100,000 books. Muslim scholars introduced precise observation, controlled experiment and careful records, according to Will Durant. 
Let's look at some of the major Muslim scientists. Ibn Haytham or Al Hazen was is often referred as world's first true scientist. He introduced uh, the optics, experimental physics, and theoretical physics. Muhammad Ibn Musa Al Khwarizmi played a significant role in the development of algebra, algorithm, and Arabic numerals. Persian astronomer Abd Al Rahman Al Sufi wrote a book called uh, The Book of Fixed Stars, and he actually described a nebulous uh, in the Andromeda constellation. The first reference uh, of what we know is of the Andromeda galaxy. The scholars also translated lots of work from Syria, Greek and Sanskrit into Arabic and produced new medical knowledge with encyclopedias and summaries. Ibn al-Nafis in his uh, commentary on uh, Amin Sina's can canon actually explained the pulmonary cell correlation for the first time. He said that um, about how the blood flows in the body and everything. So he, he explained that for the first time. The Guinness Book of World Records recognizes the University of Al Karaoin uh, as the world's oldest degree granting university. Jabir Al Ibn Hayyan or Geber, uh, his books were popular in Europe for several centuries and they introduced, they influenced the evolution of chemistry. Ibn Sina or Abyssinia, uh, his books, The Canon of Medicine, was actually used as a textbook in the universities of Montpellier and Louvain until 1650. They were well known right up till the 19th century. Ibn Farnas or Armand Freeman was the first man in the history to make a scientific attempt at flying way before the Warner Brothers. Many of the surgical instruments uh, were made by Al Zahrawi, the father of surgery, and they're still used by the doctors today. The Muslim compass was improved on 32 points uh, compared to the other uh, compass used by the navigators at the same time. Sections of the famous book Just War by uh, Thomas Aquinas were a complete translation of Islamic fiqh from Ibn Rashid's book or Avakir Rose. In geometry, uh, in geometry, the medieval Islamic art intuitively used the principles of crystalline geometry which were discovered 500 years later. There is no Newton without Thabit and Ibn Qurra or no Newton without Khawarizmi. There is no higher mathematics without people like Umar Khayyam. And that is true, it's a fact. Did you know that coffee was also discovered by the Muslims? Whether it was art, architecture, literature, poetry, calligraphy, cleanliness, astronomy, surgery, geography, pottery, or even coffee, it was truly a golden age of discovery and prosperity. Did you know that several historians and researchers are of the opinion that Muslims from Spain and West Africa had been to America before Columbus discovered America? Google this and you'll have a lot of research in your hands. When you change the uh, knowledge is free for the world and in Islamic culture it is always shared widely. It is an, actually an act of disobedience to Allah to hide useful knowledge and not share it. Muslims shared their knowledge with people of all faiths and religious backgrounds. But the deep knowledge from the Islamic world was acquired and adopted without any attribution. There is an intellectual responsibility when you borrow information from somewhere. When you don't attribute, it is called stealing. Changing the names of scientists, giving credit to yourself, and omitting their contributions from arts, science, and technology is historical dishonesty. But why this dishonesty? Think about this. Why is it that after colonization, our school textbooks no longer talk of any contributions from Africa, India, China, or the Muslim world? Is it that all the arts and sciences were henceforth, after the colonization, developed only by the Europeans? Or is it that to subjugate a people, you need to tell them that they're useless and we're here to civilize you? Think about it.